Florida. This morning, we are very pleased to have with us Alberto Borges. Uh, we had such an interesting talk. I didn't learn how to pronounce his name. You'll correct me in a moment, baby. <laughs> you did it right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <this yeah>. <laughs> um, he has a wealth of experience to share with us. This is something that uh, in an ideal world, we could have imagined having done concurrently at, or as close to Earth Day as possible. But by the time we learned of the opportunity, this was the one remaining Sunday. Um, he has uh, lots of experience in his exploration and ecological efforts. He's an explorer and youth leader. He has founded an Explorers Club in Kenya. He's been recognized by National Geographic as an explorer. He's given a TED talk. He's an honorary member of the Scientific Exploration Society in the United Kingdom. And uh, this has been a very boring week for him. Yesterday, he graduated from Catawba College. So we we're fortunate to fit in his schedule to come to our class this morning. And at graduation, he was one of the three students who got uh, big enough awards that they were included in the university press release. So uh, we are very pleased to begin learning about your work. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nelson. And uh, I want to thank everyone once again for joining this presentation. Uh, it's actually a privilege uh, to have uh, you as my first class that I'm teaching after graduation. And so this is an exciting opportunity uh, uh, for me to share the work uh, that I've been doing and what has actually been my journey to Catawba College and uh, that has just ended, but the beginning of, uh, of a new journey as well uh, into master's program, which I'm aiming to do uh, in the UK uh, later this coming year. So this presentation will uh, take you on a virtual uh, journey of uh, Kenya and the amazing uh, landscapes, the people and uh, the wildlife that Kenya has to offer. And in a particular region we're going to focus is uh, Northern Kenya. So to give us an idea of where Kenya lies, uh, Kenya lies on the east coast of Africa, surrounded by Somalia to the east, Ethiopia to the north, uh, South Sudan to the Northwest, Uganda to the west, and uh, Tanzania to the south. So our area of focus is the area you see highlighted the blue uh, towards the north, that is uh, Marsabit County. And uh, if you look up here towards the, the western boundary of Marsabit County, there's a sickle-like lake, <coughs> and that is uh, Lake Turkana. You will see this uh, feature in several maps. So the, the boundaries of, of Marsabit will disappear in the subsequent images. But to get an idea of the area, we'll be talking about the area east of the lake. So this particular general area, which is uh, it's quite a large area, it's uh, 70,000 square kilometers. So my interest in actually this particular region began about uh, eight years ago, just after graduating from high school, I uh, was figuring out what to do uh, uh, with myself. And uh, at the time I'd fond interest of reading uh, exploration books, especially for early explorers into East Africa. And one of the things that really struck me was uh, the journeys that they would lead back then having no vehicles, they would do treks from Mombasa, which is here the, the coastal area and make their way north inland, uh, looking for areas of, of interesting uh, geographical features, looking for areas of uh, minerals, and just actually mapping the area that we now know as uh, the political boundaries of East Africa. So in, in their stories, they always had this uh, fascinating encounters with uh, wildlife. And uh, Marsabit was one of the areas that features a lot in these uh, explorations, mainly because it's a remote landscape. And uh, it's an area that not many people, including not many of the local tribes in Kenya had actually visited. And the tribes that live within Marsabit were secluded to that particular area, which is largely desert. So during this gap year before joining uh, 
my undergraduate studies back in Kenya, I decided to, to go on a hitchhiking expedition that uh, would allow me to learn more about these fascinating uh, creatures that were talked about. So for instance, one of them was uh, Ahmed of Marsabit, which is, which is a tusker that is, is quite famous in East Africa because each of its tusks weighed 130 pounds. And this particular elephant was given presidential protection back in the late 70s. And uh, what's interesting is uh, it was not just the only elephant, but Marsabit in particular is known to be having areas that uh, host la la one of some of the last tuskers in the continental Africa. So a tusker would be an elephant that has long tusks that nearly sweep the ground. And to give you an idea of uh, how another how other elephants are in other parts of the country, you you notice they have short uh, stubby tusks. And some of these get to about uh, twice their length, but rarely do they get to the length you see of Ahmed of Marsabit. So on this particular elephant, I took this photo on my way to Marsabit in an area called Samburu, which is the south region of, uh, of uh, to the south of Marsabit itself. So during this uh, hitchhiking adventures, I started uh, traversing to areas that I had read about and areas that uh, featured some very interesting geographical uh, uh, landscapes. So one of them would be areas that had vast insel bugs, such as this one, which is uh, called uh, Mount Moile. And uh, when you go further inland into Marsabit, you get to areas that uh, have uh, vast sand dunes. Some are pristine white sand dunes, others have vegetation such as this. And uh, you also get areas that have very dry, rocky plains. So as far as I can see in this image, you can just see it's all this, uh, these rocks that uh, covered the landscape. So you'll notice that uh, vegetation uh, is quite minimal in this particular area. And uh, in some places, we actually have salt, salt pans. So this is a uh, Chalbi Desert. Uh, this is one of the only true deserts in uh, Kenya, and uh, this one in particular is a low-lying basin that uh, collects water during the, the 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 periodical heavy flash flood rain seasons, which uh, maybe one in one in ten years this area would be covered uh, with water, and then the rest of the years uh, it dries up and leaves the salt deposits, and that's why you see this uh, white particular substance on the landscape. And then these areas are also populated by indigenous tribes, as I mentioned. Uh, these children here that I'm standing with uh, are part of the Dasanat uh, tribe, and they are found uh, towards the northern part of Marsabit, and they go into Ethiopia as well, southern Ethiopia. And uh, here on your right, there's a Gabra woman. This is also another tribe of uh, nomadic people that are found in the desert. You'll notice they wear very uh, colorful clothings. Something that you find that a practice that still goes on even today, despite uh, most parts of uh, south, the southern part of Kenya where Nairobi city is, where Mombasa is, where people have adapted to more of a Western culture. So the people of Northern Kenya have preserved their own unique uh, cultural identity, uh, which is great because uh, that is becoming something very rare uh, to come across in most parts of uh, Kenya and indeed Africa. And uh, during my travels, the Gabra people in particular honored me with what's known as a medich, which is this, uh, this uh, goat skin that you see here wearing on my left arm. And what that symbolizes is that uh, any time that I am traveling to these areas of Marsabit, if I wear this medich, then the tribes people within that landscape will know that uh, Alberto, the person wearing this uh, medich, has uh, been culturally uh, invited and should feel home. Should feel home to travel to most parts of uh, of Marsabit without having any uh, problem or without having uh, to to report to the local chiefs and uh, explain uh, who I am and what I'm doing in their particular territories. So that is something that uh, I was awarded and that would be a very important key for the subsequent years because that allowed me to conduct uh, my studies and my research as I shall 
uh, continue to highlight. And so this, this uh, particular area has lava rocks and is found towards the west part of, uh, of Mount Marsabit. So Mount Marsabit would be this, this uh, Vale uh, Highland area you see in this image. And uh, on this particular day, we were traversing from Mount Marsabit, making our way into the desert when we came across this lava rocks area. And uh, this was the first time I was actually seeing an area just full of huge boulders, dark boulders. And I was keen on this uh, site because early on before I embarked on my journey, my father had uh, told me that if you get to an area in Marsabit where you find these dark lava rocks, if you actually split them in half, you'd find crystals within these uh, particular rocks. Well, not all of them have, but there are some that look round in shape that you'd be able to, to get uh, crystals. And those, depending on the color, if it's white, you'd get white agate, which is a semi-precious stone. If it's blue, you get blue agate, another semi-precious stone. So I was keen when we were traversing these areas to actually stop and, uh, and get some of these lava rocks. But uh, I was on a hitchhiking adventure and I was hitchhiking uh, with uh, police and uh, government administrators. So they were on a mission to go to a village that was about uh, 90 kilometers from this point. And I didn't know whether it would be appropriate for me to, 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 to enforce or ask them to stop when I was at their mercy and I was, was, uh, I was particularly getting a free ride. And I didn't know whether they were time bound. So when that thought occurred, I, I, I just decided not to ask. And the second time we were continuing to traverse this area, I, I thought about it and I said, no, let me not disturb them. Then the third time this thought occurred of grabbing this rock, I just yelled, stop. And to their surprise, the police stopped their vehicle and, uh, uh, and uh, and ask me what's going on? Why? Why did you say that? And I and I and I said, <laughs> I I really just want to grab a rock. It's not going to take uh, long. I just need to grab a few rocks, samples uh, to take back to Nairobi, which is where I come from. And uh, they took this opportunity to water the garden. Uh, so there were some people uh, who they were given a lift as well. Uh, and when I mean water the garden, I meant the, the men went to to pee and uh, take a bathroom break. And so that was my opportunity to snap this particular image. And as I was doing that, I decided that one, it's good to have a photo that shows the general area where the rock comes from, but it would be nice for me to take another image of the actual rock. So I now focused on one of the rocks, which is below us and uh, was zooming in to take a photo of it before I collected it. When suddenly something darted in and out of the, the, the rock. And within that precise fraction of a second, I had clicked the shutter image. And uh, one of the local people we were given a lift when all this quick incident happened, jumped back into the truck. And I looked at him and wondered why, why did he do that? Then I saw he was barefoot, whereas I was wearing boots. So I figured maybe that was a scorpion, uh, nothing much for me to worry about. So anyway, we got back into the truck and we continued on our safari. And two weeks later, I was uh, looking at these images with my father and uh, he, he, he came across one image which I hadn't seen. And he said, ask me, Alberto, what, 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 what is this creature? And I was like, it's a spider. And he's like, no, look at, look at the creature. It has 10 legs and we know spiders have eight legs. So I was like puzzled and wondered what could this actually be? So my journey began to travel to the museum of Nairobi to find out what was going on. And uh, after several uh, hours searching at the museum, the scientists say that I had actually discovered a new species of spider, quote unquote, because the image I took was of a creature that they had no record of and a creature that was not existing in any world database. So at this point, you must be wondering, what is this particular creature I'm talking about? Well, this is Goldie. So 
Goldie, if you have a look at this uh, particular camel spider, you'll notice by counting the number of limbs, you'll find that they are actually 10. So if you see here, one, two, three, four, five, and on the other side, five, that makes 10. And uh, that's what we were identifying with my dad and we were quite confused with what was going on. So I began doing uh, studies uh, with the help of the National Museums of Kenya to actually start collecting camel spiders and figuring out what was actually uh, this creature I had taken a photograph of. And later on, a researcher from South Africa, the only camel spider expert in the entire continental Africa joined me on one of my expeditions and later came to explain to me that what you see here is the first set of uh, limbs, these two here, are actually not legs, but what are known as a pair of pedipalps. So pedipalps have a suction cup towards the tip here that uh, they use to catch flying insects such as moths, by moths, crickets, by sucking onto them when they are close and grabbing them. Then they bring in the prey onto their huge jaws, as you can see here, to start consuming the, 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 their food. And so sometimes at a first glance or to anyone who's never seen a camel spider, which is actually not even a true spider, will come to think that uh, these are uh, spiders with 10 legs. But it is true that if they lose their actual limbs, they, they end up using their pedipalps to, to, to aid locomotion. But you'll also notice that their pedipalps are full of hairs. And these hairs are what they use to sense their way around. So you'll notice camel spiders lift these pedipalps and feel their way around the desert floor. And uh, it's, uh, it, it, it explains why camel spiders have a very, uh, very small and only two eyes, whereas spiders would have multiple eyes. So camel spiders don't see well, but they feel very well, especially the way around. So my studies, uh, on the camel spider continued uh, for about two years. And I began uh, collecting specimens and taking them to the museum. At this time, I was still not yet uh, uh, in, in enrolled in university. So I was using my gap year and the time I had at hand to actually study uh, the camel spiders. And then at the same time, because we're in a desert landscape, I'd be, the solitude of being in this remote area where there are very few people uh, got me to start thinking about other questions and other things that happen in the desert that we often don't think about, mainly because we, in the areas we come from, in the city or if you live in areas that are very wet, you, you don't tend to think the cycle of water that would happen in an area like, like uh, Salisbury, uh, Charlotte, or even Durham, where you are. So, 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 so this question started appearing in my mind and I began reflecting on what exactly happens in the desert. How, do, how does life get sustained in this particular area? So in order to answer this question, you have to look at the, at the, at the broader picture. And uh, once again, this is the Siko Lake, Lake Turkana. It's the largest desert lake in the world. And if you look at, uh, my apologies, if you look at this uh, particular area, you notice most of it is dark brown, gray, and light brown areas, signifying that these areas are largely bare. These are the desert landscapes that you were seeing in the previous images, and uh, very few green spot areas towards the south here, and the ones towards the north are actually in Ethiopia. So it kind of gives you this idea of this Mars-like landscape. And uh, it's also interesting that Mars a bit also in its name has the Mars, the planet Mars in it. <laughs> so, and appropriately looks like it from a satellite image. So in order to address these questions, I founded the Explorers Club of Kenya, which is the society that uh, leads exploration uh, expeditions. Uh, we do conservation activities in little known areas such as Marsabit, and we also publish our online e-magazine uh, known as the Explorer and uh, do charitable uh, events and activities, especially in the aim of highlighting the importance of the environment, be it in the desert, be it in the rainforests or other areas across the country and especially in East Africa. 
And so in order to, to, to focus our, 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 our work, we began noticing a green spot in Mars a bit. And again, you can see the area is largely brown. It's uh, gray shades. All that is desert landscapes, various, uh, these are some of the lava rock areas, salt pans here towards the white and sand dunes in the light brown. So this green spot drew our attention and we started wondering what was going on there. So we traveled to Mars a bit and we found that this place is an oasis in itself, an area with euphobia forests, green, an area that has springs bubbling throughout the mountain, areas that had amazing abundance of uh, flora. And uh, flora, the plants, because of their diversity, meant that more animals, more fauna, the animals, are able to be sustained. So anything from insects to birds to mammals to reptiles uh, would be able to find food with all these uh, riches. And on top of that, we have a lake that's, that's uh, called Lake Paradise and was actually aptly named by two American explorers in the year 1905, Martin and Osa Johnson. So this area, the green spot was an oasis. It had forests, it had springs, it had small rivers, and it even had uh, three lakes. So this is one of them. This is at the summit. And uh, you'll notice that with all this water and with all this greenery, food, it's able to support a plethora of animals, including the center image here is what we have, the gravy zebra. Now the gravy zebra is an endangered animal only found in Northern Kenya. It used to be found in parts of Southern Ethiopia, but no longer exists. But we find these uh, creatures in Marsabit. So it's a privilege to have an endangered animal, but it's also a challenge for the people of Marsabit and certainly for ourselves at the Explorers Club of Kenya to ensure that these creatures continue uh, thriving in this particular landscape. And then of course we have uh, various insects, various uh, reptiles, uh, Egyptian vultures, impalas, and, uh, and other birds. And of course, you also get the elephants, uh, you get the gerunuk, which is this, uh, it's known as the giraffe uh, antelope here at the bottom of the image. And you get this bastard uh, of a person, <laughs> of a bird. Uh, it's actually called the Huglin's bastard. And uh, I don't know how it got its name, but uh, certainly, uh, they, 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 these large birds uh, don't like uh, being photographed and are very cryptic. So probably that's why they are bastards. And uh, so one day when I was uh, here at uh, Lake Paradise, I began questioning where does the water that feeds this lake come from? Because if you look at the rim of uh, the lake, you'll notice there are no inlets or outlets. There are no streams coming in. And uh, that got me wondering what's going on in this particular landscape. And so in order to understand, again, we have to look at the broader picture. Now, here you're looking at a map of uh, the Eastern part of Kenya. This is Kenya, this, uh, this is our boundary. And uh, with Somalia, this, this area towards the East is Somalia. And then we have the Indian Ocean. So <clears throat> unfortunately for Somalia and fortunately for Masabit, Somalia is a very low-lying country, and the trade winds that come carry moisture from the Indian Ocean go over Somalia without dropping their moisture and get into the eastern part of Kenya. And again, this particular area known as Wajia is uh, very low-lying. But when, this, when the winds get towards Mars a bit, they start rising up the volcano, and uh, that in, eff in effect causes uh, orographic uh, rainfall or relief rainfall. And that allows moisture all the way from the Indian Ocean to find its way inland to Mars a bit. And that's how you find that this particular area has the green spot because the moisture comes in and uh, it gets uh, captured by Mount Mars a bit itself. And certainly when you're traveling to, to Mars a bit and to the mountain in particular, you'll get these uh, signs that uh, along the highway that tell you the, to be aware of uh, strong crosswinds. And uh, that's for good reason because those winds are coming with, uh, uh, with high speed all the way from the Indian Ocean. And if you look at this uh, larger image, you'll see this 
highland area in the background that is actually Mount Marsabit itself. So it's a shield volcano. That means its base is wider than it is tall. So it's a very, it's, it's not a very tall volcano, but a very large wide base volcano. And that allows it to, to, to capture a vast area of, uh, of landscape that would otherwise miss this orographic rainfall. And so our research at the Explorers Club of Kenya started answering the question about the water cycle and the hydrology of Marsabit. So now we know that water comes in from the Indian Ocean, comes to this green spot, but how does it move from the green spot to the oasis, the lowland areas? You'll find there are no rivers that leave Mount Marsabit. The small streams end up going underground, underground uh, some uh, faults, and these faults, especially on this edge, you can see this, this, this particular area you're seeing here, this stark contrast between this dark brown area to the white area, that's actually a fault line. And you can see it all, all, around, all around this particular area, and that's the base of Mount Marsabit. And what happens is that through these faults and cracks underground, you find water makes its way to areas that are in these red spots. And these red spots are actually oases that you'll see on the ground. <clears throat> so the, <clears throat> excuse me. So the oases we find in the deserts are actually fed by water that's coming from Mount Marsabit. And this is an example of an oasis. So an oasis is, is an area that's very important in the desert because it allows the nomads with their camels, it allows for, for wildlife to come and get water in an otherwise barren landscape. However, this isn't, it, it's not all pretty and, uh, and uh, as glamorous as it uh, sounds. There are times when Marsabit gets drought, times when the rivers and the streams, the oases, they begin to dry up. And uh, what happens is people begin to die of hunger in Marsabit, this fantastic landscape that we are seeing. And uh, one thing I like telling people about Marsabit is that it has so much for the eye to see, but very little for the stomach. And uh, certainly that becomes true when you start seeing images like this, where someone has to bend down to a dry riverbed to search for water. And it, it, the situation gets to points where people die. So it's, it's very unfortunate. <clears throat> and so I began wondering why in the desert we are having, we are having people, especially in Marsabit, die of, uh, of uh, hunger, die of thirst. Yet in the books I was reading about 120 years, 150 years ago, uh, written by explorers into this particular region, they talked about areas that had elephants, antelopes that were in plenty. And I'm going to show you a quote later on towards the end of this presentation. And so I was struck, why, why is this happening? And uh, when you begin to travel the area, you start noticing that areas of Mount Marsabit itself were facing deforestation. And this deforestation was causing uh, an area that would otherwise, like for instance, this face, an area that would otherwise capture moisture is no longer being effective. And during the dry season, like, that, like in this photo I took in 20, 2014, you find that uh, most of the streams will dry up. There's not much moisture that gets caught up and uh, that definitely affects the water situation, which in turn causes a food shortage. And then eventually people began to fight. People begin to fight for pasture. People begin to fight for wells and water points across the landscape because that becomes uh, a scarce uh, resource. So in order for us to, pro to understand and to start conserving the landscape, so that areas like this in the desert that get natural clean water bubbling, we needed to address the situation that was happening in the mountain. So we began what's known as the Marsabit tree project. And uh, the idea was to, to plant trees and reforest, regress and renew this landscape that is on the edge of the forest, such as this area here, where these were previously forested areas, but now you can see the forests uh, shrinking. Uh, it's becoming drier. It's becoming uh, more of a grassland. 
and that does not help in capturing moisture coming in from the Indian Ocean. And so in order for us to actually ensure that our project would be successful, the key to the future is actually to educate the young children. And so National Geographic supported uh, several workshops we did in 2018 and 2019 that were aiming to focus on students and get them to understand the importance of protecting the environment. So in this particular workshop, what we did is we got experts from the Kenya Wildlife Service, we got entomologists from uh, parts of the country. And uh, in fact, we were even privileged to be joined by Mr. Mike Clifton from the UK here, who was able to bring his wealth of knowledge on insects and uh, invertebrates and start inspiring students to take an interest in nature. Because it, it's only when you have an interest in something that you develop a love for it. And when you love something, you want to see it renewed and be cared for. So one way to do that is to actually educate people on what uh, is needed. So that way we are also securing the future. And then the students in return, they would present to us uh, what they learned. That, was, that meant our workshops were very engaging and uh, getting students to do things physically and get hands-on involvement means that they care about this. And some of the posters they created for their schools show that show messages such as let's preserve our wildlife, our pride. And that's what we want uh, people to, to think about nature and that caring for environment is important. And uh, some here even talked about pollution, which in itself is another topic uh, as we were discussing with Nelson uh, prior to this uh, session. And so once we also educate the children, the children then have an incentive to go back home and talk to their parents, talk to their communities about what they have learned in school and start inspiring them, especially their parents and the elders to, to, to think about their, their environment and think about their children's future, the kind of landscape where the children will be inheriting or growing up in the future. So protecting it now would also be vital. So we, we began having conversations with uh, members of different communities in Marsabit and we developed uh, maps that first would map the area that is currently vegetated. So you'll find that uh, it's mostly towards uh, the north here, uh, the northeast, we have uh, vegetation and some of this is also grassland. Uh, then of course, there's the green spot, uh, Mount Marsabit here towards the south and uh, there's some other two small green spots uh, towards the west. And here we had an area where it's in blue, this uh, blue sausage like uh, shape is an area that was actually green in the past uh, 50 years, but has actually transformed into uh, a dry landscape. So our project aimed to focus on these two areas because they are vital to the water ecosystem around the desert landscape. So we began by mapping the areas that we would target. So two kilometers buffer zone areas, two to five, depending on which uh, area they are focused. So if it's the area towards the, the sea, so coming in from Somalia, we'd have a wider buffer zone and away from the mountain, we'd have a narrower buffer zone. And well, what we did was uh, we, once the students were involved uh, in, in our activities, they brought in uh, members of the community. And now we had a wider audience. We had a wider interest in the project. So we were ready to go out and actually start uh, implementing things. So this was in 2019, May. I was uh, convening and talking to members of the community, explaining to them what we are about to do. And some of them had already been involved in the decision-making uh, process of uh, the project, as you shall now see. So we got onto planting trees, literally. Uh, one thing I enjoy doing is, uh, and, uh, and we find very valuable uh, as a team is to invite uh, women. They come along with, uh, with, their, with their friends and uh, even they come with their children. So the children, even as young as two years, begin playing with the dirt, playing with the soil and even uh, learning about how to tree plant. And this become very important uh, uh, experiences that the children gain towards the uh, towards the years to come. And of course, we also engage uh, high school students and uh, students from uh, middle school. So 
we had a massive tree planting campaign. This uh, project was sponsored by the St. Luke's Episcopal Church here in Salisbury, uh, as well as uh, Catoba College. And we had uh, even the members of the Kenya Forest Service uh, train people on how to plant trees and then everyone got to work. So we, on this particular event, we had over 120 people and we've had uh, several of these events throughout uh, different parts of uh, Mount Marsabit in those buffer zone areas. And then we have also began to realize that it's important to target people in the desert. So like in this particular area, this is not all. But in the desert, you can't plant trees uh, from seedlings. So one thing that's interesting is we have this concept known as seed balls, which are, which are in these bugs uh, here on the ground. Is a seed ball is a, is, is, is a, is a technology and in, invention that someone uh, created where instead of uh, dispersing and planting seeds in the desert areas uh, like that, which eventually get consumed by insects, consumed by birds, or consumed by rodents, and therefore it become ineffective. If you coat a seed in charcoal dust, the dust protects it from consumption. And because another challenge in the desert is we never know when it's going to rain. So if you have the seed coated in charcoal dust, it remains dormant and can be dispersed throughout the desert areas. Then once it rains, whether it's going to be in the next uh, month or it's gonna be two years from today when we have dispersed the seeds, the, the, the seeds are still protected. Once it rains, the charcoal dust becomes nutrition for the seeds and the seeds begin to germinate and get uh, boosted. But the trouble is in the desert, uh, you can't uh, plant trees easily, but grasses, grasses do well and grasses are fodder that people can use. So we dispersed uh, seed balls in the desert. Then in the, in the mountainous areas, we realized that we were having communities that were planting trees, but during the rainy season, but then during the dry season, there was no way to, to, to nurture the trees. There was no way to store water. So we realized that it would be important for us to donate water tanks to communities as well. So we, here's an event we were distributing uh, water tanks that would hold like about 5,000 to 10,000 liters of water, depending on the size and capacity. And so these communities were then able to store water during the rainy season that would then be used to, to, to water the trees during the, the dry season. And uh, here's an example of a uh, seed ball towards the top left. You can see that it's largely charcoal dust. And once the seeds get enough moisture, they start germinating and this charcoal dust itself provides nutrition. So in this particular event, we distributed over 50,000 seed balls. This would be in August of 2019. So this was pre-COVID. <laughs> That's why no one has masks on. Uh, now, today, our events are, are, are drastically different because of uh, COVID. So we don't hold large events nowadays. We, we do extension work where we go to the communities uh, themselves. And uh, this is an example of uh, some of the extension work. So we, we go to, to, to the, we work with youth and women groups and farmers uh, around the mountain. We hand them seed balls and uh, we get to see how the progress of their tree nurseries are. And so here's an example of what happens to a seed ball. So some groups like for trees, you, you, your best shot is to plant them in a tree nursery and then raise the seedlings and nurture them. But for the grasses, it's best to disperse them on the landscape and then forget about them. When it rains, the grasses germinate very quickly and that provides fodder to livestock. The trees need uh, definitely need more caring. And these are indigenous trees native to, to the mountain itself. So we don't promote trees that are found in, in other parts of the country because that can bring its own ecological disasters like we have seen, especially in Australia where introducing new species causes uh, the environment to drastically change. But when we plant indigenous trees like this, as you can see, there's a variety here, then we, we ensure that uh, uh, we are preserving the ecological heritage of the particular area and that uh, we are promoting the biodiversity as well. 
So you plant a seed ball into one of these bugs, they begin to germinate, as you see here, and then with, with time they grow, they grow uh, with nurturing, especially when uh, the communities use the water tanks, we provided them to water the, the trees, and then from there they can plant them in areas uh, other than that. Then for the grasses, you just disperse them in a field like this, and the grasses grow. Now this particular youth group, this is their chairman, what this group does is because there's usually a shortage of fodder towards the dry season, especially towards the mid to the end of the dry season, uh, communities would pay people who have hay or grass stored um, in, in barns to actually to buy the, the hay for their livestock. So this youth group decided that they would not be planting trees they would instead prefer to have grasses because grasses earns them quick money. It allows them to avoid engaging in social crime uh, within Marsha Bit Town and gives them some economic activity uh, and uh, money to put in their hands uh, during uh, difficult hardship times. So this grass will be harvested by the group. Then the group stores it, uh, gets, uh, gets it into hay, and then later on uh, farmers and uh, pastoralists will come and purchase uh, the hay from them that provides money and that allows them to 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 sustain themselves and avoid getting into social crime. Especially young people are prone to to robbery and prone to disturbing the community. So this is an alternative and a much uh, friendlier way. It's also ecologically viable for us. Then the trees you had seen we were planting as a massive group. This is one year later, you can see they have grown to about a meter in height. The Kenya Forest Service came later on uh, that following year to put an electric fence so that uh, livestock can, uh, can stop going or strain into the forest. And uh, that allows the trees a chance to grow. And the trees do very well. If you plant indigenous trees in an area where they grow natively, uh, they, they, because they are acclimatized and they are used to such conditions, they take off very well. And uh, as you can see, one year later, what we were planting on the ground has grown, grass has grown to avoid uh, 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 soil erosion and to keep moisture within the area. And also in this image, you can see uh, how the mountain itself traps uh, moisture from Indian Ocean. So on this particular day, a storm was about to hit later that afternoon. And that in itself just naturally provides water to the trees here. And if you look here at the, uh, the background, you'll notice we are the forest edge. So these are the mature trees of Mount Marsabit. And this is the start of the buffer zone. So we are targeting areas where the tree line ends and we have uh, areas that, are, that were either formerly forested like this area or areas that are naturally dry up, but we want to expand the forest cover of the mountain. So to, to, to reorient us, some of the sites I've been showing you, uh, particularly in this area, uh, the center of, uh, of Marsabit County. So this is Mount Marsabit in green here. It's also a national park area. So hence you saw the fence to avoid uh, uh, cattle from straining. But towards these areas where the red spots are, these are drier areas. Uh, so, so the park covers both the highland areas, the savanna areas, and a bit of the desert edge. And we have started expanding to Huri Hills, which is the blue spot, if you remember in the other previous map, this area. And the desert uh, locations where we have been distributing grasses is these two areas here. And these red spots are actually areas we are going to target uh, in the near future. And if you notice, these are also the areas where the oases are. So we want also areas that are naturally having water, like the oasis, to have trees that are native to those areas grow there. Now, this, the project has actually been very successful that uh, to the extent that the Kenya government has invited the Explorers Club of Kenya, actually, we were invited earlier this year to take up some more areas within the forest block uh, towards the edge of the forest to start planting uh, trees that neighbor like communities here. So this is a, a, a future prospective site that we are trying to raise funds for. If you look here, it's about 57.7 uh, uh, hectares, this block that was assigned to us. It, it neighbors uh, the Hula Hula village. And so it, 
covers part of the buffer zone that we were talking about. And what happens is because the trees we are growing are native, coming from the forest itself, within two years of uh, us planting this site, we haven't yet started doing anything. Within two years, this site is going to look like this area towards the, towards the south. And then within five, five years, it gets greener, greener. And then by the time 15 years have gone by, it is this dark green that uh, allows uh, the forest to expand. So our target area is all this area here. It's about uh, two kilometers from the edge of the forest. You can clearly see the edge of the forest on this image. So these are the areas we are targeting with our project. And uh, another area that they have asked if we could uh, get involved in is known as the Songa tree planting site. This is a smaller area, it's uh, 11 hectares. This would require maybe for us to plant about 6,875 trees. And this area again surrounds, uh, is surrounded by some village settlements towards the south. And what we are aiming to do is uh, typically communities like here that surround the forest would illegally cross into the forest to look for fodder, to look for water, to look for food, medicinal plants. And uh, that causes them to get prosecuted by the park officials if they are found there because that becomes illegal activity. And uh, they, they risk a lot by going into the forest. But what we thought about is what, and what we're aiming to do with the Masabi Tree Project is to bring those very resources that they go in to the park illegally back to the communal areas. And so this is one of the sites that is outside the park, but within the communal areas. The government has asked if we could get involved into tree planting the site. The community actually set aside this area. Uh, this village said this would be an area that they would like to set aside for the tree planting activity. And uh, we are now looking to raise, uh, it costs about, one dollar and twenty five cents to plant a tree and nurture it for two years and uh, combine this site and the previous site that I showed you those would be like 40,000 trees in total so I'm looking to raise uh, about fifty thousand dollars to cater for these two project sites uh, within the next two years and that would allow us to expand the buffer zone area it would allow communities to stop going to the natural forest itself because when they're going with their cattle another thing that happens that we don't usually think about is they trample on the seeds and the trees that are growing, the small saplings, the small uh, trees that are just germinating. The cows trample on that, and that uh, in itself is threatening the natural forest's ability to regenerate itself. So as all the trees dry, die out and all the trees fall, then the smaller trees, the saplings that are supposed to replace those trees are being stepped on, being crushed, being uh, killed by the livestock or even being consumed by the livestock. So you find that the forest is just getting older, but there's nothing that's replacing it. So having these uh, buffer zone areas is important because we stop livestock from going in. We allow the forest to expand naturally like it would without human interference but we at the same time, we target the, the human settlement areas for us to have uh, uh, those resources into the communal areas. So it's a very important project. It's a win-win, whichever way you look at it, whether if you're looking at it from a communal aspect, if you're looking at it from a forester's point of view that we should protect the forest. So uh, that that's what makes our project quite unique. and. Uh, some of the, the successes we attribute is actually to the support from communities here in the US uh, through foundations or through church groups uh, that enable us to continue our work and protect uh, God's creation. So if we don't act now, the challenge we face is that the desertification from Chalbi Desert is continually expanding. And this was an image I took in 2017 these were previously areas that would have been what we consider what, what are known as dry grassland savannas or thicket and bush. And uh, these have already succumbed to desertification for prolonged drought. And usually these acacia trees that dot the landscape, which are very iconic to Africa, are always green because they are, they, they are adapted to surviving 
and thriving in dry conditions. But when you see them starting to turn brown and starting to wither away, then that tells you that the, 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 the situation we have challenged to address is, is quite a serious one. And so our project is not one that we are looking into doing in the future. It's one that like right now should be ongoing. And uh, with the small grants we have received, the small donations we have received, we are starting to make an impact. And uh, now we are being challenged uh, both by desertification and by communal needs to expand our project into covering the areas that I've highlighted. So my ultimate goal is to actually take up this uh, lodge. It was a former hunting lodge in the park. Uh, Kenya stopped uh, hunting, banned hunting in the late 1970s. So this lodge uh, got abandoned. Uh, it's within the forest itself, as you can see, it's quite green. It overlooks a natural lake, one of the crater lakes and uh, uh, it's, it's owned by the government. The government has asked whether we would be interested in uh, taking it up. And uh, one of the goals we had as, a, as a, an organization is eventually to start our own conservation center in this particular area so that we are permanently based on the ground and we'll allow groups of people where the community to come in uh, learn about the environmental awareness. It will be our hub for exploration. And at the same time, we are looking at ways in which students from Catoba College, members of the community here in North Carolina, can eventually travel to this uh, amazing landscape and get to volunteer in hands-on projects uh, on the ground that work with communities and, uh, and foster a better environment that uh, our, our Lord has provided us and we uh, charged as stewards to ensure its survival. So that's my ultimate uh, dream. Uh, and uh, this is the quote that I was uh, telling you from one of the early books I read. It states here that the region quotes uh, was, uh, was full of rhino and elephant, and the former were so numerous as to cause the caravan to halt several times. That was a quote from Dr. Arthur Donaldson Smith of Pennsylvania, USA, when he traveled uh, to the area in 1895. So this is an image uh, of them being chased by an elephant in Marsabit. Now, as, you know, as exciting as it may sound and as deadly it may sound that you're being charged by an elephant uh, in a landscape, I would actually prefer to face such a situation personally than to read about it in books and to just come to the realization that that was something that happened in the past and will never happen again, because we have lost all our elephants, we have lost all our rhinos, uh, thanks to desertification and the lack of food for both wildlife and communities. So I, I think it, we, it's a better problem to be chased by an elephant than for us to actually read about it in the accounts of early explorers. And so with that, I'd like to thank the following organizations for their support uh, in towards this project and the continual involvement in what we are doing uh, in, in Kenya, uh, especially Catoba College and the St. Luke's Foundation here in Salisbury, as well as our local partners, Kenya Wildlife Service, uh, Kenya Forest Service, Bantu Organic Detergents, and of course, National Geographic. So if you would, uh, like to ask me any further questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I want to also thank you all for your time. I think it's been uh, a, a great uh, pleasure to me to educate you and uh, tell you more about the work I've been doing. And uh, if you are interested in getting involved or contributing towards this project, you can always uh, reach out uh, through Catoba College. Uh, you can always send a check to them. They have a, an account specifically created for this project. And uh, just remember to quote Kenya Conservation and uh, all donations go onto the ground towards supporting our work. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. You spoke of some of the lands being protected as uh, government parklands. 
I'm assuming by you, you speaking of nomadic tribes, there are other lands that uh, have ownership other than what we would think of in this country for uh, who actually is responsible and can, can help support this these intents over a longer period of time? Indeed, that's a great question. Uh, land uh, in Kenya is, uh, falls under three categories. You have areas that are government-owned land, and that's usually national parks, national reserves. Then you have communal areas, so any other area across the landscape, including like the deserts, the, the communal areas where people live, and areas that uh, we, we see as being bare land, those are actually areas that the pastoralists own and areas where they keep moving out and about depending on the seasons looking for pasture. And then the third one is uh, private owned property. So there are areas, especially towards the south of the country where, where people buy parcels of land, maybe one acre, two acres or small plots where they can own the land for perpetuity and uh, do as they please depending on the zonation of uh, of the land use as per government plans. So those are the three areas, but largely in Marsabit, we'll be talking about communal areas. And that's why you'll notice my specific project addresses communities needs particular, because the last thing uh, we as the Explorers Club want to do is to go into these areas and uh, go with the mentality that we are experts in environmental conservation. and implement project plans that we have put down in paper sitting in an office in Nairobi uh, that have no realization with what's on the ground and the challenges that uh, we face, uh, that communities face on the ground. So we always involve communities, we ask for their opinion, we ask them to, 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 to get involved in our project so that it's a win-win for everyone. So uh, thank you very much, Alberto. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, Harry. Henry. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to know what your connection was to Duke and how you ended up speaking to us today. I didn't hear that at the beginning. Oh, I see. <laughs> so um, good question. One of, uh, one of the congregation members is uh, Sharon uh, Anjali, and she she, I met her through uh, a family gathering uh, here in Salisbury about uh, a month and a half ago. Uh -huh. She learned about my story and uh, my project and was very interested in, in wanting me to actually speak to this class uh, uh, on Sunday so that I could uh, share the work that I'm doing. And so she made the connection with uh, uh, Pastor Greg and uh, eventually Nelson got involved in uh, setting up uh, the class, which happened to work timely uh, just after my graduation. <laughs> yeah, well, so. well, that's great. Well, that's wonderful. So you said you're starting a master's program. So can you just tell us a little bit more about your career and where it's going? And do you live in Salisbury and go back to Kenya or how, how does that work? So I'm actually mostly full time in uh, Kenya. Uh, I, I was born and raised in Nairobi, and uh, I, I stay in Nairobi. Um, after my, well, now that I've graduated, I'm intending to do my master's in the master's of science in global biodiversity change, and that would be in the UK, uh, University College of London. And at the same time, I'm working with the Catoba College. Catoba College is very keen on having the conservation center that had uh, pointed out earlier that former lodge, uh, they are keen to having it become a potential study abroad option for uh -huh. students post COVID right. pandemic. So, right. uh, those are some of the activities that I'll be getting involved in, as well as uh, doing the tree planting uh, of the two sites that I had uh, highlighted earlier. On. Well, I guess a follow up question is how did you get connected to Catawba College? Indeed. <laughs> so my connection with Catoba College was through a gentleman known as uh, Dr. Luke Dollar. He was actually a student of Duke University, uh, both for his undergrad and his uh, master's through PhD. 
uh, he I met him at uh, Washington DC uh, during a National Geographic uh, conference in 2017. He was so fascinated to hear about my plans. Back then I hadn't done all these projects. It was just the camel spider. And so he asked me whether I'd be interested in transferring my studies from Kenya to the US. And uh, at first I declined his offers. I told him I'm already enrolled. Why would I uh, swap in between to come? And then I happened to travel to Madagascar and met students from Catoba College oh. that, were, that were on a study abroad uh, activity for a month. And I, I, I came to learn about the amazing program that's offered here at Catoba College. And the fact that uh, Dr. Luke Dollar was able to also get a scholarship secured for my studies just allowed my, uh, my transition from Kenya to the US. And it's been a fantastic experience. I think the educational experience I got here in Salisbury uh, at Catoba College has just been a uh, transformation in itself and oh, prepared me for the next steps ahead. <laughs> well, that's great. Thanks so much. That helps a lot. Mm -hmm. So. Any, any further questions? I th think there's something on the chat. Okay, uh, thank you, Barbara. And uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Greg. Appreciate the comments as well. Why don't we, as we usually do, unmute ourselves and express our thanks for these insights and how we should observe and cherish the creation that we've been entrusted with. Good. You're welcome. Yo, thank you so much. You're welcome to linger and post.